Hello, this is week three process control. The Zoom recording of our class on Tuesday didn't record all the way through, so I've made a new video here just to capture the main points in case you didn't make the class and wanted to catch up. Okay, process control week three. In the synchronized class, we reviewed the main points of the week's material and uh, assessed our skills on a few points. So the first thing was we looked at differential equations. We've seen with Laplace transforms how we can tackle certain types of differential equation and put them into a system where we can solve them and we can manipulate them really conveniently uh, to solve control problems. Um, but to do that, they need to be linear differential equations. So we need to make sure that we understand what those are. So we looked at a few examples just to make sure we can identify the type of differential equation we've got. This was the first example and we looked at it and we identify that the highest order of the differential term is 1, so it's a first order differential equation. The differential term here is the total differential, not a partial differential, so it's called an ordinary differential equation when it involves the total differential. So it's a first order ordinary differential equation and is it linear or non-linear? So we need to consider the y term for that. We want to know, is it linear in y? And all of the y terms are on their own and not raised to any power. So there's no y squared, there's no y times something else y. So this is a linear equation. So it's first order linear ordinary differential equation. This was our second example here we want to again identify the type of equation. Uh, we've written it with a y dashed, so y dashed means dy by dx. We can identify that x is the variable here. So this is uh, a total differential, so first of all we can note that the highest order of the differential term is this one, so it's a first order term. It's a total differential, so it's an ordinary differential equation. It's a first order ordinary differential equation. Is it linear in y? We notice this term here, e to the power x, well that's non-linear, but this isn't a term of y. It doesn't matter what x is when it comes to solving the equation with our methods, what it needs to be is linear in y. However, we've got a one minus y term times y dashed, uh, so that would give y times y dashed. That's a non-linear term, and so this is a non-linear equation whilst we have that type of uh, combination. So this is a second order, non-linear, ordinary differential equation. A third example, a few differences here. First of all, we can see, well, u is our function we want to solve for. It's a function of t, obviously, and it's a function of x as well. So we've got partial derivatives here and here. So we can see that this isn't an ordinary differential equation, it's a partial differential equation. We can see clearly that the highest order of the differential terms is 2. We have a d2u by dt squared and a d2u by dx squared. So it's a second order partial differential equation. Is it linear or nonlinear? So we need to check whether it's linear or nonlinear with respect to u, the thing we want to solve for. Uh, whilst we have nonlinear terms of t, u is linear. This term here of u is on its own, not raised to any powers, and this term u of here is not raised to any powers and is not multiplied by any other function of u. So this is a linear equation. So this is a second order linear partial differential equation, or PDE. Another example, again, we can see quickly it's a partial differential equation in x and y. It's second order, and this one is also linear. So this is uh, another second order linear partial differential equation. A final example, we can see it's second order we can see we have a total differential here, so it's a second order ordinary differential equation. And here we have a term sine y. We're solving uh, 
for y, and so this is a nonlinear term of y, so it's not linear in y. So it's a second order nonlinear ordinary differential equation. So we know that we can solve um, systems which involve second order or first order differential equations. We can solve them whether they're ordinary or partial differential equations, um, but the requirement is that they are linear. And we saw at the end of the final mini lecture from last week that um, if we have a nonlinear equation, we need to linearize it. So we have the techniques using the Taylor series to turn a nonlinear equation into a linear approximation in the region that we're interested in. And so if you identify that you have a nonlinear equation, you're going to have to apply one of those techniques to tackle it. We reviewed the technique from the previous week of characterizing system with a general equation. So many systems are first order and um, many first order systems can be characterized with this equation where we have kp over tau s plus one. And the characteristics of this are the same no matter what your system is. You can write many different systems uh, and then find what kp equals and find what tau equals for that system. And the overall response has the same characteristics. kp is a steady state gain. So that means if you have a unit step change in the input, the step change at steady state in the output, or the steady state output change, will be kp times the magnitude of the input change. And then tau is a process time. That tells us how long it takes to approach the new steady state value. And in one time constant tau, your response will reach about 63% of the new steady state value. So we saw that we can characterize a system like that. We can either start by deriving the equations that describe our system and writing them in this form, or you can take data from a real process and look at it and back out what these parameters kp and tau are. So here's an example of some data. It's a response to a step change. Uh, it's a response to a unit step change. You can see our function changes from 30 to 40 uh, against time in seconds. First of all, we need to remember, we need to look at the deviation variable, the deviation from st steady state. So before time zero, where the step change happened, our function s was at steady state, so we had a constant value of 30 before that. So we take that as our reference value and we say that's zero, and then the response is the deviation from that. So here, instead of 32, it's two, and it's four, and it's six, and eight, and 10. So that's the deviation variable. Then we can look at the response. The response uh, increases with the step change, and it approaches a new steady state. So we can read off our value of kp, the new steady state value, as kp equals 10. So for a unit step change, that means our um, input changed by a step value of 1, uh, and the output has changed by a step of 10, or sorry, has changed by a, an amount of 10 after it's reached a steady state. So that means there's a gain of 10 for this system. A step change of 1 will result in a steady state change of 10. So that's the gain. How long does it take to get there? So we can read off our value at about 63% of the way to the new steady state. And then we can find the time it took to get there, and that's four seconds. So tau is equal to four seconds. That gives us the characteristic time response of the system. This means that we don't need to derive all the equations necessarily for a problem. We can just look at its response and immediately work out what its characteristic transfer function is going to be. So that was a simple first order case. And then we looked at what we do for higher order systems. And we remembered that from the mini videos, higher order systems can result from either uh, intrinsically higher order processes, or they can result from having uh, a cascade of one first order process followed by another first order process or they can result from having uh, controllers built into a loop, which will then um, increase the order of the uh, overall process. Now, when you um, increase more first order processes, 
the result is that you get another first order process, but it tends to be slower in responding. It tends to be more sluggish. So that means tau tends to be greater. Um, and you can tend to uh, approximate this as just a first order process with a delay. So here is a first order process with a delay. And again, we want to check that we can back out what the values are for this. So again, we first of all need to get our deviation variable. So this is the steady state value at the beginning. So that becomes our zero. And then this is decreased in response to the step change, the unit step change. So it's decreased to minus 15 at the new steady state. So first thing we can say is that the gain of this system, the steady state gain is minus 15. So a unit step increase has led to a steady state step output of minus 15. Secondly, we need to account for this delay. We can simply read off the delay is five seconds. And so that's represented as TD. And in our transfer function, that's represented by the e to the minus 5s term. And then thirdly, we can now find the time constant. So we need to find 66% of our response to the new steady state. So that's that distance there. And then we read off where that happens. And what's important here is the time from here to the start of the response. So we don't include the delay time in this. It's just this distance here, and that's 10 seconds. So we have tau is 10. So our overall transfer function is minus 15 e to the minus 5s divided by 10s plus 1. So we can use that to describe both a, a process which has a simple time delay, uh, or we can use it to approximate higher order processes which end up looking a bit like this. So understanding that, we went into the second order system, and uh, whilst the full derivation of the transfer function and its characteristics is available. We did so in the lectures and it's certainly available in the textbooks that we recommend. Uh, we know that we can use the same idea. Whilst there was a, uh, there's a characteristic equation that describes most first order systems, here's a characteristic equation that describes most second order systems. And we see some things are familiar. It's got the steady state gain term. It's got tau, a process time term, and it has a new term, zeta, which we call the damping factor. We looked at what the characteristics of this are. Now, we've previously used the partial fraction method to find the roots of this equation, and then we knew that we could uh, separate this function into um, partial fractions, uh, and each of those fractions would represent a different response of the system. Um, so we know that the roots of this equation are important. Uh, what we went on to describe are poles. So in control theory, we take the uh, characterization of a response um, by calling them the poles. We have poles, which are the values uh, of s, where the denominator of the transfer function is equal to zero. Uh, there's also a thing called a zero, which is where values of s, where the uh, uh, numerator of the transfer function is equal to zero. Uh, we've not met those yet, so we just concentrate on poles. And you can see the poles of this function are where uh, values of s where it's equal to zero, so we can use the quadratic equation to find values of s where the um, denominator will be zero. And we have this, minus zeta over tau plus or minus root zeta squared minus one divided by tau. So those are the poles, and we say that uh, the response is going to be characterized by what those poles are. Uh, well, first of all, you can see that if tau is large, then this term is going to dominate, and if zeta is large, or tau is small, uh, this term will dominate more. So a large zeta means a high damping factor. Uh, this term will tend to dominate, and then uh, that would be like a first order system. So a high damping factor makes this more like a first order system, um, and uh, a low damping factor, or relatively large tau, will make this um, more of a second order system. And those effects will become more apparent. So looking at the poles, there are some different cases. I'll uh, just look at it this way first. So in the first case, if zeta is equal to 1, what will happen? So if zeta is equal to 1, zeta squared minus 1 is 0. Uh, and then this term is 0. 
so we have multiple poles uh, and they're both one divided by uh, minus one divided by tau. Um, so these are both negative and real. In that case, we know that the response would be um, a, a simple decay. If uh, zeta is greater than 1, we have the case. There we go, I'm missing a little bit here. We go. So if zeta is equal to 1, that's the case. If zeta is equal to uh, is greater than 1, so if zeta is greater than 1, then zeta squared minus 1 is always going to be greater than 1. So this term is always going to be a real number. So we're going to have two real and distinct poles. They're both different because we've got a plus or minus of that real number. Um, and well, certainly the case where this is minus is going to be negative. We've got a minus number, minus another number. Um, in the case where it's positive, could that ever result in a positive value of s? Uh, well, we've got zeta squared minus 1. Zeta is greater than 1. Uh, so this term here, the square root of this, it's always going to be less than zeta, isn't it? Because uh, we have zeta squared minus 1 taking the square root. So as zeta tends to infinity, this, will, this whole term will tend to zeta, um, but it will always be less than zeta. So even with the case of adding this on, uh, this is always going to be a negative value of s overall. So if zeta is greater than 1, we're always going to have two real and distinct and negative roots. Uh, if zeta is less than 1, then we have zeta squared minus 1. That's going to be a negative number on the inside of that. So this will be a complex number. And we have plus or minus that, so it's called a complex conjugate. Um, so we have two complex poles. And the characteristic behavior of the systems can be mapped out. Um, and in particular, we use a complex plane. So we've got real and imaginary axes, and we can plot our points. So in the first case, where zeta is equal to 1, we have multiple points where they're negative, which is here. Uh, in the case where zeta was greater than 1, we had two negative distinct poles. So zeta greater than 1, we had perhaps these two values here. And in that case, we have a response, which is simply an exponentially decaying response to a step change. In the case where we had two complex poles, uh, the real part of them is the same, um, and the complex part is either plus or minus, so they are symmetrical about the real axis, like this. Now those two points will respond, uh, correspond to a response like this, where we have a uh, the uh, step change perturbation, and then we have an oscillatory response, but it's decaying towards uh, a new steady state. And uh, for example, that's what we saw with the uh, headband example in the lecture. So as long as the real part is negative, then we'll find that we have a response that decays to any steady state. If the real part of the res of the um, response, uh, sorry, if the real part of the root is of the pole is positive, then we have unstable responses. So if it's real uh, part positive and a complex number, then it will be oscillatory, but it will be getting increasing amplitude. And if there's no complex part, if it's just a positive real number, then we'd have an exponentially increasing response. Typically for control problems, we want to be on this side because we want our system to respond to a perturbation by steadying back down to uh, the new steady state value rather than losing control. So we reviewed that. Um, and then our final point was just to consider um, how we could tackle systems. We saw that the Laplace transforms uh, approach works nicely when we had a process which only had a, a forward direction of influence. So we looked at the example of two tanks where fluid is flowing from one tank to another, but the fluid can only flow in one direction. So the fluid can flow from tank one to tank two, uh, but it can't flow backwards. The rate of flow from tank one to tank two would depend on the height of liquid in tank one. And likewise, the height of liquid in tank 2 would determine how quickly it flows out of tank 2, um, but it doesn't result in any backflow. And in a case like that, it's very nice because we can simply multiply the individual transfer functions together to get the overall system transfer function.
However, in the mini lectures we noted that for cases which are not like that, where you have a coupled system, here are two tanks where the height of liquid in tank two does influence the flow backwards, uh, and you could have flow backwards if this height was higher than this height, then that means that these systems are coupled. So even though we might have an individual transfer function for them, um, we can't simply multiply those together. So in this case, we do need to work out the equations um, in detail for the system, um, and then we can take the Laplace transform and then solve the set of simultaneous equations that result from that so that we can find out the overall transfer function uh, by that route. Okay, so thank you very much. We uh, then went on to look at the week's problems, and uh, next week uh, we'll have some new things to look at. We've not really done any control yet, but so far we have established our theory. Um, we've looked at how to start to look at how to look at real data and use that to characterize a process. Um, so uh, we've also looked at inputs and outputs and how we can identify the right things to monitor and the right things to adjust to establish control. So we're building up our toolkit so that we'll be ready soon to uh, look at actually how to build a controller for a process. Thank you very much.